What's up everyone, it's Prion Joni, and today I'm gonna to be showing you Pioneer DJ's latest brand new professional DJ multiplayer, the CDJ 3000. I'm really excited to show you guys this one because it's the first CDJ release that has happened since I started working for the company. I got to see firsthand the hard work it takes from the engineers to the product planning and all the research to put together a multiplayer. But before we dive into the features, a word from our sponsor, Direct Music Service. DMS is an online database for working DJs and mix artists. It's the one-stop shop where you can get your music from for your gigs. It's a searchable, organized database with thousands of edits, remixes, and different versions of your favorite tracks from many different genres. What's also awesome about Direct Music Service, if you're always on the road just like me, they have this awesome mobile app so that you can search your favorite tunes, put them on a wish list, and they'll be ready for you on your Dropbox folder when you get home. You can now save some money and get a discount using one of these two coupon codes. Use the code PJMONTHLY and get 30% off your first month off any monthly subscription. Use the coupon code PJYEARLY and get 10% off your entire first year of any yearly subscription. Go to directmusicservice.com today to sign up. And before we start, if you've already been trying to buy the CDJ3000 and some of the dealers already have it listed as sold out or back to pre-order only, or there's an odd number, maybe one or two left and you're trying to get more. As of right now, when I'm recording this video, there's still plenty left in stock at Zounds. Their payment plan program is one of the easiest to qualify for online. So if you're trying to get these today, be sure to follow the Zounds link down in the pinned comment or the comment below. So the CDJ3000 was designed to enhance the experience of the current users of the CDJ2000 Nexus 2. And it all starts with the heart of the unit, which is the MPU, the microprocessing unit. It's the most powerful MPU on any DJ multiplayer in the market. It has a total of six cores divided into two groups. I need my notes for this one. One is a 1.5 gigahertz dual core ARM Cortex-A57. The other is a 1.2 gigahertz quad-core ARM Cortex-A53. Not only does it improve the speed and performance of the player, it gives us at Pioneer the ability to upgrade features on the player as years come. That means there's gonna be new features that are gonna be rolled out without the need for you to buy a new player. The build quality is improved from the 2000 Nexus 2. It's designed so that you can operate it in up to 150 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm sure that's way above anyone's comfort zone to be playing outside. <laughs> but more importantly, it's designed to be able to take the environment that laptops would overheat in. The design is a little bit more desert proof. We're gonna talk about the jog wheel more later, but it is particle and dust resistant. The cooling system is also designed to make sure that dust particles don't get inside the components. It has a full metal faceplate throughout the entire top. When you first touch it, you will notice that all the knobs and sliders, and even the paddle, feel a lot tighter. They don't move around as much. And if you were wondering what the teaser video is all about, the Q and play buttons are made to be able to withstand up to a million clicks. So that means I can do my Q button scratch all day. Now this was built specifically for the pro DJs. A lot of the design decisions were based on research of 200 major artists. The player is targeted specifically for the users who perform at clubs and festival stages. The design language is about simplicity of use and setup. Dedicated buttons means one button equals one function, one deck equals one channel. CDJs on the festival stage are often used in four, and these are made to be able to use in six if you have a six channel mixer. And the pro DJs don't wanna risk any confusion about the function of a button or an entire deck. When you got multiple decks laid out, you don't wanna forget that you might have had a performance pad set to roll loop when you meant to click a hot cue. Dedicated buttons that are one button for one function eliminates that risk. Also, it keeps the setup simple and less confusing for the stage crew. It has to be simple enough that even the least knowledgeable stage crew person can simply just hook it up and it's ready to go. Instead of trying to manage multiple riders with multiple configurations with just two decks. Plus the folks who play on four decks want to be seen with four decks. Now let's talk about the brand new nine inch display. 
It is HD 720p and the refresh rate is 60 frames per second. It's a lot smoother than it was before and this is probably not that obvious on camera. And it's a really efficient use of the entire nine inch space of the display. Sometimes the display can be bigger, but the effective use is a lot smaller than the size of the entire display. It's also a pressure sensitive touch display. The reason for this is because that way we can have it pressure sensitive so there's no accidental triggering of any of the functions. And also not having it as a multi-touch reduces the risk of accidental triggering when there is moisture on your hands. Have you ever tried to use your phones when your hands are clammy or if they're wet? You notice that sometimes it's either not responding or it's responding incorrectly. DJs are gonna be playing in environments where they're most likely gonna sweat. I hope they do. <laughs> so this keeps it from having those issues known with multi-touch displays. Now, unlike before, you can now load the songs or click the songs with the touch screen. And you can also touch to scroll, including flicking the playlist. Now, speaking of the playlist, if you notice, it's made to look more like how it looks inside Rekordbox. You got your preview waveform, your track, your BPM, and your key. And you can always pull up the info on the upper right. The display is super bright and it's made to be brighter than the CDJ2000 Nexus 2. I have it set to three, but we can take the LCD all the way up to five. Now the JOG LCD brightness is independent from the main display. And also, you can adjust the brightness of the LED ring in case it's too bright at a dark nightclub. Now, if you notice, I access my playlist by this new playlist button, which before you had to access by going to browse and then selecting playlist. But now it's a shortcut button that just takes you straight there. Now for the source, it used to be that there was dedicated source buttons. Now it's a single source button that opens up a menu where you can select your source. We got our HID mode or we have our export mode depending on what you have connected. Now let's talk about the waveforms. Right now I have it set to RGB. I'm gonna go into my shortcut menu and I can switch it to the blue waveforms or I can switch it to the three band waveforms that was introduced in Rekordbox 6. The three band waveforms has a separate waveform that you can see bass, mid and treble. So there's a total of three waveform types that you can use. I generally like to keep it at RGB. What's also cool with the nine inch touchscreen, it gives us space to be able to stack the waveforms. So say I have a song playing here and this is set to master. I can see this waveform on the top of this when it's playing. So now I can do waveform matching or grid matching depending what I'm using. This thing's at 132, let's bring this up to 132. And now we have our transients that we can visually see to match. What will always show on the top is the player that's set to master. Now there's brand new harmonic key features that are built into the player. You are now able to change the key of a track per every semitone and also shows you the Camelot code. So say I have clarity here, the acapella. I can change the key by clicking left or right on this. Now it's F sharp minor. Now it's G minor. Now the key shift is an advanced one that helps prevent a little bit of chipmunking or Darth Vadering, which means it's trying to reserve as much of the format as possible. Now, if you go extreme like five semitones up, you're gonna hear a little bit of it, but it tries to prevent it as much as possible by replacing the upper harmonics and putting them down below or taking the lower harmonics and filling them up high. Very similar to how Complex Pro works in Ableton Live. That way, when you're doing key shifting, it doesn't sound like you're key shifting. Let me show you. We got this track. That's one semitone up. Two. Three. 
Now I can hear a little bit of stretch once I'm past three, but it's still decent. Now, when we're really far, it starts to show a little bit, but you have a lot of room to shift the key. Now, why do we have key shifting? This way, if you're one of the folks who likes to mix in key, I do, you can now change the key of tracks, similar to how we can already do in Rekordbox, and match it with the song you're playing. Now, in addition to being able to shift the key manually, there is a key sync button right here below the beat sync button that will do the key matching for you. So if this track is in F minor and this one is in F sharp minor, by clicking key sync, it's going to lower this track to match this one. So next we're gonna talk about the gigabit ethernet connectivity when you're using the Pro DJ Link. Basically CDJs have always been able to interlink with each other, including with a DJM mixer that is capable of Pro DJ Link. One of the questions folks ask is that why isn't there Wi-Fi on these players? Well, when you think about it, Wi-Fi itself is not a reliable platform. You have to think from a pro DJ standpoint on a festival stage, they're not gonna be trying to get on Wi-Fi trying to access to get their music. They're usually just gonna bring one of these. It's simple and it's not prone to any of the problems with Wi-Fi as far as interference or reliability. With thousands of people in the crowd all most likely gonna have a smartphone on them, you can never predict how wireless interference is gonna play in a setup. Tiesto and Skrillex aren't gonna be trying to access their title or their Beatport link during a performance. So rather, it was prioritized to improve the speed and stability of the connectivity of the players, especially since the CDJ3000 is now capable of being used six at a time. That's why gigabit ethernet was implemented instead. And speaking of stability, this is also why the USB ports are USB 2.0. USB 2.0 is more than adequate enough for high-speed data transfer of music files. There wasn't really a performance gain with USB 3.0, but there was a penalty with stability. And this isn't just on CDJs. If you've ever used a USB 3.0 hard drive, and you used it on a USB 3.0 hub, sometimes you might notice it gets disconnected. I notice this all the time when I'm using multiple USB 3.0 devices on one USB 3.0 hub. And the same devices being used on a USB 2.0 hub never seems to have the same problem. Now, this doesn't mean you can't use a USB 3.0 or 3.1 flash drive, which I use. It just means that your connectivity to the player is gonna be USB 2.0. Now, why would someone use a USB 3.0 hub if that's a 2.0 port? Well, on your laptop or computer that you're exporting to, it just increases the speed of exporting to the flash drive. But once you put on the player, it reads as 2.0, it's stable, and it's still fast. Now, there's a small change to the loop functions. Before, on the CDJ 2000 Nexus 2, there was a button where you can initiate a four beat loop, and if you hold it down, it can be an 8-beat loop. Now, if there is a dedicated 4-beat loop button and an 8-beat loop button. What's cool with the loop buttons is... As soon as you press the button, the beat loop functions show up and you can immediately change the loop length up to 32 beats. So if you initially wanted to do something longer, you could just start with the eight beat loop and then just increase it to 32 beats immediately. I'm editing this part in because I discovered this later in the video, but the loop buttons, the reason why there's two is because if you click four, four beat loop, and you want to tighten it immediately, you can click it and then if you press it, it's gonna cut in half to a two beat loop, and if you press it again, it's gonna cut in half to one beat loop, then a half beat loop. If you do an eight beat loop, if you press going up, it doubles it. So you can use these buttons once a loop is engaged to control the loop length. Now brand new to the player, there are now dedicated beat jump buttons instead of being on the touchscreen like they were before. This allows you to skip on beat ahead of the song or prior to the song. So if you're trying to lengthen or shorten a phrase, you can use the beat jump buttons to skip ahead or go backwards on a track 
on beat. And right now it's set for 16 beats, but if you open the beat jump button, you have this menu of beat jump lengths. This is 16 beats, or you can go eight beats. And by default, it's set to 16 beats, which I would say is about half or maybe a quarter of a full house music intro. Now you can actually change the beat jump length by going into the utility, going into DJ settings, go to beat jump value, and you could lower this or raise this from a half a beat all the way to 64 beats. I kind of like mine at eight beats instead of 16, so we'll keep that there and we'll do that for both. Now, if you notice, there is only one knob for the vinyl speed adjust. And by default, it's only controlling the brake. So you have instant start, but you have wind down turntable style brake. Now, I know some people do like the wind up start, but we remove that because a lot of people sometimes accidentally move it and don't mean to use it and just prefer the advantage of a digital player being able to do instant start. Now, if you really, really want the wind up start, the slow start, you can go into the menu and back at DJ settings, you can go vinyl speed adjust. And right now by default, it's set to touch. If you set it to release, it's only gonna control the wind up during a, a start, but it's gonna instantly stop. Now, if you want it to be controlling both, you can set it to touch start. And now the one knob controls both the startup time and the braking time. That setting of touch and release is basically the default that you would find on the single knob on the CDJ900 Nexus or the XDJ1000 Mark II. I'm just gonna keep it back to touch since I never have a reason for using a slow release. Now let's talk about the hot cues. They are located underneath the screen. There are now eight dedicated buttons for the hot cues. Before on the CDJ2000 Nexus 2, there was four buttons with a bank button so you can either access the first four or the second four. So now there's no more flipping of the banks. Now the reason for this position is because upon research, this was the more preferred position because if you have them down here, you have more of a risk of folks accidentally touching them when they're manipulating the jog wheel. Some folks like to actually rest their hand over here. Now in a two deck setup, that might not be the case, especially on a controller. That's why controllers have them over here. But you gotta think, if you're using them in four or six decks, you're a lot wider from the reach of the outer CDJs, and you increase the risk of accidentally touching them down below. Also for folks who are turntablistic with the CDJs and like to scratch, having performance pads or hot cues down below prevents you from doing a couple body tricks because you might accidentally touch those in those circumstances as well. So it was decided that it was best to be below the display and above the jog wheel. And also you gotta think, a lot of CDJ users have been using CDJs for many years, since maybe even as far back as the CDJ 1000s. These were the first players to feature hot cues. And when you look at the positioning of the hot cues, they were always on the upper left corner, and that has been pretty much the same all the way to the 2000 Nexus 2. By having them over here, it's not a huge jump from the comfort zone of legacy DJs playing on the previous gear especially for those DJs that are going back and forth between the 2000 Nexus 2 and getting on a 3000. It's not a huge change from where they're used to. Some folks brought up, what about accidentally touching the jog wheel with your wrist, palm, forearm, or elbow? Well, you would have to be a little bit praying mantis style. It's made so that if you are gonna be performing with the hot cues, there's enough clearance that you kinda go around it when you're using it. Now, if you're really concerned with accidentally touching the jog wheel, you can always switch the jog wheel to CDJ mode. So if you accidentally touch the jog wheel, you could literally 
be typing on the hot cues with no problem. And just to compare the two risks of having it down below and above, accidentally hitting the hot cues is a lot more devastating than accidentally touching the jog wheel. Touching the jog wheel, it corrects itself once you let go. Accidentally hitting the hot cue, it'll throw you in a position of the song where you might not want to be. And once again, if you're using multiple CDJs and they're a lot farther out, you have a lot more clearance from the jog wheel than you do hovering over hot cues that are down below. So we mentioned the jog wheel. Let's talk about the jog wheel. As I talked about earlier, this may not be obvious with how it looks, but the jog wheel has been redesigned. And I'm not just talking about the new LCD display and rotation indicator that can show your album artwork in the middle. I don't usually have album artwork, so I can't show it. But what some folks don't know is that the mechanism of the jog wheel hasn't been redesigned since the CDJ-800. The CDJ-800 had a bearing mechanism, and that's basically been the same mechanism that's been used all the way to the 2000 Nexus 2. The only other full-size pressure-sensitive jog wheel, say that three times as fast, was the previous CDJ-1000, which came before the CDJ-800. And this one had a really high friction jog on it. Now, in a lot of photos, it looks the same. It has the same design ridges on the outside, same LED ring from the 2000 Nexus 2 and all the flagships. And the only visible difference is the LCD that was inspired by the DDJ-1000. Inside it is no longer the bearing mechanism and it was redesigned. And it was risky redesigning it because the bearing mechanism was a staple for many years for the flagship model that was industry standard. It's one of the hardest things for competitors to imitate because one of the hard parts with a stationary non-moving jog wheel is just the balancing of the weight. That's why maybe some players it's harder to scratch on because it's just not the same as what it was on the CDJs. This new one is made to be smoother, quieter, and resistant to dust particles, sand, like I mentioned earlier. In fact, there's a lot more give when you put the tension control down. It really spins. I like to set mine at two o'clock. Now, I don't have a 2000 Nexus 2 here. I have an XDJ 1000 Mark II. Like I said, same bearing mechanism. I'm gonna put them side by side and I'm gonna show you how they sound like compared to each other. Put the tension all the way down. huge difference and it's one of those things that like on the product photos or even the videos it doesn't really jump out at you but you will notice this right away when you play on this player especially if you're used to a 2000 Nexus 2 it feels different now the surface of the jog wheel has these grooves some people have even described it to be more vinyl like I won't even say that it's vinyl like but it increases your grip I know when I do my boomerang scratches I don't tend to slip out like I do on the other players. Usually my hand tends to move outward, but it doesn't do it here. It tends to stay put. These grooves keep your hand better gripped to the player. So my benchmark on any player, not just the Pioneer stuff, but my benchmark for accepting a jog wheel is if I can do the Peter Piper routine using that jog wheel. There are jog wheels out there that I have difficulty with, but generally, if I can do the Peter Piper routine on it, I, that's when I'm cool with it.
There's so little resistance that I, I think I might even wanna click this a little higher <laughs> next time I do that. But I love how this feels because it doesn't feel to be as restrictive as the previous jog wheels where I really have to press, especially when I'm used to the touch sensitive jog wheels, the capacitive jog wheels on the controllers where I need to, I learned to have a light touch. So I really like how this one is. Another thing I like to do is I like to turn the jog adjust up and now I haven't been able to do this on the previous CDJs, but I can do a little bit of drum scratching. That's something that I wasn't able to do on previous players, at least not that well controlled. <laughs> well, I've done Rock the Bells, done Peter Piper. What about my let me clear my throat routine. All right, so what about HID mode? Well, the CDJ3000 does work in HID mode with Record Box in performance mode, and it does do hardware unlock of Record Box 6. That means you don't have to have a purchase plan to use Rekordbox 6 in performance mode with the CDJ 3000s. You just have to plug it into a USB hub and plug it into Rekordbox. Now let's set the controls. Set this for deck two. Go to source, set this for deck one. And now I can use Rekordbox DJ with the CDJ 3000s. And in HID mode, I am able to access the playlist of the software with full view of the waveform. And that's what you can do in Rekordbox. Now to change the waveforms, let's say it's set to RGB right now, we do have to go in Rekordbox to switch this out. Preferences, go to audio. I prefer RGB. So now, when I switch my waveforms inside Rekordbox, it switches it on the players as well. The controls for switching the waveforms in HID mode it will not be on the utility. You would have to go into the software. But pretty much the experience is the same. You have full 60 frame per second waveforms, just like you were in standalone. So you still have your loop buttons. Four beat loop. Cut it in half. Or expand it by doubling it. And you still have beat jump, which is set to 16 beats. And uh, let's see if you can change this. Nope. You're gonna have to change the beat jump length in software as well. But for the most part, for the performative functions, the HID experience with the CDJ 3000s is practically identical when you're using it in performance mode in Rekordbox. Now the most common question is, is it Serato DJ supported? The answer to that is not yet, but it's on the way. It'll be sometime in 2021. Now, what about Tractor? Well, there's discussion with Native Instruments, but currently there's no confirmation for a set time when that would happen. And some folks might ask, what about Virtual DJ? As far as I've seen, I don't think I've seen a Pioneer DJ product that Virtual DJ hasn't supported. That ball's in their court, and I don't wanna speak for the company since I've never had a discussion with them, but their history has been that they've always supported the flagship player. And they usually don't announce it before they release it, they just go ahead and release it. So it's just a matter of time from how I'm feeling about it. Now we're gonna talk about the load time in a bit, but one of the things on the previous players that made it hard for folks because of the slower load time was to preview tracks that they, are, they might wanna play because the load time is so slow. So previewing tracks can be a really slow process on the older players. So there's these new preview functions on the CDJs that allow you to be able to preview a track 
listen to it in the headphones without actually loading it on the player. And the way it works is it works in the Pro DJ Link and you have to have a Pro DJ Link compatible mixer, which is like the DJM V10 or even the 900 Nexus 2. So when you have a playlist open, you can actually just click the little waveforms on the left and it'll actually let you hear it in the headphones. Now I did a little hack here where I took the headphone output and I routed it to channel five. So just so that you guys can hear it. So anything that you hear out of channel five is actually coming out of the headphone output. So I'm gonna turn on the headphones link so we can activate link preview, turn up channel five. So just say this is your headphones and I'm gonna hold. And you can scrub through it. And you can scroll down and just preview your other tracks. And mind you, you can do this while that player is actually playing. So let's load a track and then let's play this track. It's playing on channel four, but I'll turn down channel four and we'll go back to playlist. And if you notice, while channel four is playing, I can preview my playlists. And scrub it. Now I came up with this little headphone trick just so that I could show you guys how to do this without pulling out real headphones and just trying to show you what it sounds like. But I also realized that this is kind of a dual layer function. The link preview is actually a practical use of being able to play more than one track at a time from one player using the other side as a way to listen to tracks before you load them. But this headphone connectivity trick that I put together just for this video, I was also able to use it as a way to trigger samples. And let me show you what I mean. So say I have a track playing on track four. I can use, I can pull up a playlist and trigger maybe even voiceover samples. Now it wasn't meant to be used like that, but I can use it to pull out voiceovers or sound effects and use the link preview to be able to do that. I'll show you guys how to set this up in an upcoming video, so stay tuned for that. And what's cool is with the link preview, it doesn't violate that design aesthetic of one function for one button or one function for one feature. Now another cool preview feature, say you have a song playing and play on channel four, but you wanna see what's ahead of your track just to see where it's going. Well, I'm gonna turn down channel four while it's still playing, as you can see, and I can actually do what's called touch cue, which is to hear ahead of the track while it's still playing from where it's at. See, it's still playing from where it's at, but in my headphones, I can skip ahead and listen later in the track just to see where it's going. So Link Preview and Touch Cue are two new features that you can use in a Pro DJ Link setup. So let's talk about the loading time of songs. Well, thanks to the new microprocessing unit, load speeds of tracks, including tracks with eight hot cues, are four to five times faster than the previous CDJ 2000 Nexus 2. Now, I don't have a 2000 Nexus 2 here. I have the XDJ 1000 Mark II. I don't know if the load speeds are comparable, but it does let you load up to eight hot cues. If you wanna see the load speed comparison between a 3000 and a 2000 Nexus 2, go check out DJ Ravine's video where he does an in-depth comparison and actually has a speed test between the two. But I, I was just curious, I wanted to see what the 1000, the XDJ 1000 Mark II would be like compared to the 3000. And I'm not even sure if the 1000 Mark II would be similar to the 2000 Nexus II or if it's a little slower. But just for fun, let's do a little drag race. My Clarity Acapella with eight hot cues, here we go. Loaded already practically instantaneous 
with the new CDJ3000. Now, like I said, this was for fun because the XDJ1000 Mark II was the only one I have here, but it does have a similar load time to the 2000 Nexus 2. I'm not gonna do the 900 Nexus because it doesn't have hot cues on it, so load time would be a little different. Now let's talk about the sound quality of the CDJ3000. It has a new digital to analog converter and used along with the new MPU. It is capable of up converting your audio files from 44.1 kilohertz sample rate and 16 bit to 96 kilohertz and 32 bit. It's literally like the technology out there that can turn a standard definition DVD quality video and up convert it to 4K or some of the other technology that interpolates a low frame rate like a 24 frames per second video and brings it up to 60 frames per second. On the 3000, it's basically the audio version of that technology. And dare I say, the sound of your audio files going into the CDJ3000 and being played back from it will actually sound better than how they originally are. Now, better is a subjective term. What does that exactly mean? Now, it might not be obvious on small speakers in a bedroom DJ setup. It'll be a little bit more clear in a studio setup with good high fidelity studio monitors, but in a proper large speaker system, like maybe say something with the XY series speakers, there's a huge clarity difference that makes the audio sound more pleasant to the listener while having better instrument separation. And because of that, there's been improvements even to the key lock function, which is the, called the master tempo on CDJs. The resolution of the time stretching of the master tempo is so much more accurate that you can get more extreme tempo changes and it sounds a lot cleaner. Now, once again, I keep referring to this video. DJ Ravine did a really good comparison at plus 16% between the 2000, and 2000 Nexus 2 and the 3000, but we'll try it out with the XDJ1000 Mark II and the CDJ3000, and right after that, we'll do it with the CDJ900 Nexus and the CDJ3000. I'm gonna do the test similar to the way he did. I got the same songs, and they're looping at the same parts, so it's my Sound of the Sea track. So here we go. All right, not too huge of a difference in the plus, which I typically expect, but let's do the extreme minus 16 and try this out. Okay, I hear a bigger difference at minus 16. What it is is like, I, I, I hear a little bit of, um, it's like a bit crush sound when it's stretching at minus 16 on the XDJ1000 Mark II, which is normal when you're doing time stretching with the master tempo. But it sounds a little bit more filled out on the 3000. And it makes me curious, so I wanna take this down to minus 25% and see if we can hear a difference.
Here's where you'll really hear it at minus 70. See, there's like a little bit of a uh, high frequency noise because you're hearing, you're hearing the sample separation when it's doing the time stretching, but you hear it being filled out. Not saying that it sounds good at minus 70. I don't expect anybody to be playing at minus 70. I hope not. But you hear that it's filling out those spots. So you're not getting that, that weird little noise that happens when you're pulling the tempo down. And that just shows how well the Master Tempo is working on the CDJ3000. Now let's try it with the CDJ900 Nexus. Okay, CDJ900 Nexus, CDJ3000, they're both at plus 16. Here we go. Okay, let's do minus 16 and uh, starting with the CDJ900 Nexus. Okay, and we did minus 25 and minus 70, so we're gonna just throw those in there as well. Now we're going to extreme wide tempos. Alright, and we'll do minus 70 since we did that as well. Minus 70.
So let me show you some of the things that it comes with. It comes with a really well shielded digital cable. So that's now in the box. So you don't have to go out and get one like you did before. So there is no reason now to be using the RCA when you're playing standalone. Unless you're using a mixer that doesn't have digital inputs, of course. Also, it comes with a locking IEC cable. It locks to the player, to the plug, so that it doesn't pull out easily. And we know in a festival stage, CDJs get moved around a lot. You never know if you're starting to loosen it up and it just a little bit of vibration from the subwoofers could completely unplug it. Now it's not gonna come off because it's locked on there. And what's cool is that it's yellow so you know which side is up. And I noticed that when I was putting this back together, I was like, oh, that was simple. So two videos I recommend if you wanna find out more about the CDJ2000, aside from the official videos on the Pioneer DJ YouTube channel, check out Phil Morse's video overview on digital DJ tips. That one is a really good in-depth of all the features on the CDJ3000. And of course, the one I've been mentioning, DJ Ravine's comparison of the CDJ3000 with the CDJ2000 Nexus 2. Once again, I'm gonna leave product links down below from Zounds. From the time I recorded this video, they still have these in stock. If you guys got any questions, comments, or anything to add about the CDJ3000 professional DJ multiplayer from Pioneer DJ, please leave them in the comments section below. Would love to hear your thoughts, answer any questions, or learn anything new that I haven't even covered here in this video. I know we're all still learning these players right now, but I kind of want to hear some feedback from you guys that maybe from some of you that already used it and that I haven't even discovered with these players. If you like this video, please smash that like button. And if it's your first time here and you found this video useful, please click that subscribe button and don't forget to click that little bell icon so you get a notification the next time I upload a video. And yes, if you didn't figure out how to do it, I'll show you guys in an upcoming video how to do that link preview trick playing it in another channel so you can use link preview like a sampler. Don't forget to add me on Instagram where I share exclusive content that I don't normally share here on YouTube or where I share sneak previews of my upcoming videos. All right, really appreciate you guys for watching. Thanks, take care, and stay healthy.